Hello, and welcome all of you to the National Arts in Education Week and today's Because of Arts Ed event. I'm Nora Halpern, Vice President of Leadership Alliances at Americans for the Arts. We want to send our particular regards to those of you watching from the fiery corners of California, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington State, as well as those of you who may be impacted by Hurricane Sally. We're very glad you made the time to join us. We've got a great program planned today and we're excited to get started. I know that everyone watching now supports arts education. And so throughout today's event, you'll be reminded to show that support by signing the arts education pledge at americansforthearts.org forward slash because of arts ed. We need to continue to build the army of citizens advocating for arts education so that our voices become exponentially amplified on Capitol Hill. Please send a text with the word arts, that's A-R-T-S, to 833-932-2382 and we'll reply with a link. It costs nothing to sign the pledge and you can write to us and tell us why arts education is important to you. If you're inclined to do more and want to support our work, you can make a donation through the same link. And with that, we'll get things started. I will be co-moderating today with my colleague, Narek Rome, who is Vice President of Government Affairs and Arts Education at Americans for the Arts. We're honored to be joined today by Representative Suzanne Bonamici of Oregon, who we'll hear from shortly. In addition, I want to welcome Americans for the Arts Artist Committee member Annette Benning, a Tony Award nominee, four-time Academy Award nominee, two-time Golden Globe winner and Screen Actors Guild Award winner. Annette is also co-chair of the board of the Actors Fund and a proud mother of four. Denise Graves, also joining us, is an Emmy Award winning operatic mezzo-soprano and educator. She's received many international awards and prizes, including the Marian Anderson Award, which she received from Ms. Anderson herself. In 2003, President George W. Bush appointed Denise as a U.S. cultural ambassador, and at that time, she traveled the world on behalf of the nation, after offering master classes and workshops. She is currently a professor at John Hopkins Peabody Institute, as well as at Juilliard. Nine years ago, Denise created two scholarship funds in her name at the Johns Hopkins Peabody Conservatory to help support the costs associated with pursuing a singing career. Denise also sits on the artist boards of both Lincoln Center and Opera America. Longtime artist committee member Josh Groban, also joining us, is a Grammy and Tony Award nominated singer, songwriter, and actor who has entertained us with his multi platinum albums and DVDs, as well as through his electrifying live performances, his work on Broadway, as well as in film and television. Josh is the founder of the Find Your Light Foundation, which we'll hear more about later. Dr. James Haywood Rowling Jr. is a dual professor of arts education and teaching and leadership and serves as the chair of Syracuse University's arts education programs based in the university's colleges of visual and performing arts and the School of Education. Dr. Rowling is the incoming president of the National Arts Education Association beginning in 2021. He is a visual artist who has also won three Grammys as a member of a Tabernacle Choir. And I want to welcome all of you and thank you for being with us tonight. To begin, I'm pleased to pass things off to our colleague, Robert Lynch, President and CEO of Americans for the Arts, who will introduce our first guest. Take it away, Bob. Thank you, Nora. Um, and I want to also say thanks to all of our Americans for the Arts team and good evening to uh, all of our participants. Um, I am speaking to you tonight from uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where we like to pronounce it arts education. Um, so, you know, I'm up here and I'm hearing that from all of my former neighbors. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to try not to go there too much. Um, Americans for the Arts is celebrating the 10th anniversary of National Arts and Education Week, along with our national arts uh, education partners, including the National Art Education Association, joining us, of course, for our event today. Um, during this week, the field of arts education uh, joins together in communities all across the country to tell the story uh, of the impact of the transformative power of the arts in education. I'd like to recognize one of those partners, the Arts Education Partnership, for holding their virtual gathering this week and celebrating their 25th year of work. 
We've enjoyed being a partner with them over the years and look forward to continued advances in arts education policy together. Throughout this week, uh, arts education supporters are celebrating virtually, um, celebrating in their local communities and sharing stories on social media about the impact of arts education. And they're using the hashtags because of arts ed uh, and arts ed week. You've seen virtual students uh, displays from uh, Spicewood Elementary School in Round Rock, Texas, uh, and Keller Junior High in Schaumburg, Illinois, daily teacher appreciation events hosted by arts education in Maryland schools, compelling testimonials about the arts from students and teachers, and proclamations both at the local and at the state levels from places like Brevard County in Florida to statewide proclamation um, in North Dakota, all in an effort to highlight the tremendous impact of the arts in education today in our country. This is an important time uh, for arts education here uh, in America. Since 2014, um, just a six year period, over 35 states have revised their arts standards uh, in the five uh, covered arts disciplines of music and dance and theater and visual arts and the newest discipline, media arts. And since President Obama uh, signed the Every Student Succeed Act in 2015, which I had the, the great honor to witness at the, at the White House signing ceremony, there have been many opportunities for arts education to succeed. But there are also many, many challenges and barriers. Public funding challenges, racial inequities, COVID-19, to name just a very few. Uh, Americans for the Arts with guidance from our Arts Education Council, along with many national arts education organizations, has been pursuing equity in education to ensure that for all students, a complete education includes the arts, both in school and out of school. Uh, and one of the things we do is to uh, push that by advocating for uh, leadership in arts uh, education policy advancement and doing things through our sister organization, the Americans for the Arts Action Fund, a 501c4 political organization, like the banner that you see behind me, Arts Vote, pushing to get the vote out all across America, uh, vote for arts and arts education um, centered uh, leaders to get them in office. The, um, the kinds of things uh, that, uh, that we are, are looking at uh, this year, 2020, is unlike any other year. The impact of the coronavirus pandemic has threatened the traditional delivery of education and with it, arts education. With 63% of community arts organizations having severe financial loss and 90% uh, having canceled events, uh, and, and most schools currently pursuing a virtual learning environment, there's an immediate challenge to ensuring that the arts can maintain uh, their valued place in the school day and after school as well. You know, yesterday I was, I was visiting uh, an independent living community where my, my mother resides, uh, and I was stuck, uh, struck by how many doors and spaces there were, um, were adorned with art produced by the residents there, which is, if you think about it, a benefit of an arts education of a long time ago. Uh, their human expression today and continuing arts education that goes on there, um, still happening is very important to those human lives uh, on a daily basis. Um, there is a longer term threat. Uh, the economic impacts of the, the pandemic uh, at the school and school district level uh, are still looming ahead. Uh, and advocacy by attendees like you um, will be greatly needed to prevent the arts from being singled out in budget cuts. And that economic, uh, it's not just a human loss, uh, it's, it's a huge economic loss because what we know is that the economic uh, impact of the arts in our nation is $878 billion according to our own federal government. So uh, all of these topics will be covered by our terrific guests today. Uh, I'd like to add my welcome to 
um, Antoinette Benning and Suzanne Bonamici, Josh Groban, Denise Graves Montgomery, and Dr. James uh, Hayward Rawling, uh, Jr. of uh, the National Art Education Association. Annette and Josh and Denise, as, as working artists, have each helped us extensively in thinking through policy issues and with um, educating decision makers about the value of the arts. And Josh has even testified for us and come to Congress and walk the halls with me. And I greatly appreciate that. Uh, National Art Education Association has been a valued, valued partner. And, and Dr. Um, uh, Rowling himself is an artist, as you heard from Nora. And the great Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, well, uh, You'll hear more in a moment about, about our a treasure for arts education in America. Um, but here is a great team for, uh, for you tonight uh, on, on our panel here and for this discussion. Once again, we hope you will show your support for arts education by signing the Arts Education Pledge, uh, Nora talked about by, or Narek talked about, by going online to americansforthearts.org slash because of arts ed or texting ARTS to uh, 833-932-2382. So that's A-R-T-S capitalized to 833-932-2382. So I now have the pleasure of introducing a great arts education champion to start us off and share a little with us about the congressional resolution that declared this week to be National Arts Education Week. The United States Representative Suzanne Bonamici representing the first district of Oregon uh, in the northwestern corner of the state is a member of the House Education and Labor Committee and the Science, Space and Technology Committee. And she is also the founder and co-chair of the Congressional STEAM uh, Caucus. Uh, she is the um, uh, best friend that arts education has in the United States Cong uh, Congress and a great friend and colleague to uh, Americans for the Arts and to all of us here. So thank you so much, uh, Con Congresswoman, for joining us this evening, particularly with all that uh, you and your state uh, have on your plates today. Uh, I'm excited for our conversation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, United States Representative Suzanne Bonamici. Well, thank you so much, Bob, and thank you to Americans for the Arts for inviting me to participate in tonight's event, and thank you for the outpouring of support and thoughts and prayers for Oregon at this challenging time. Uh, it's really an honor to be included with such an esteemed panel, and I'm very happy to be with you, albeit virtually, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Congressional Resolution uh, declaring the second week in September National Arts in Education Week. And I really appreciate uh, my colleagues who served at that time. They understood the critical role that the arts play in developing well-rounded critical thinkers. And since joining Congress in 2012, I've sought to continue and in fact build on their work. I know these are incredibly challenging times for everyone, including our nation's young people who may be finding it difficult to understand and cope with this new reality. But that's why arts education is more important than ever. It provides a way to help people cope and to connect. And when this crisis is over, and it will be at some point, the arts will continue to play such an important role in helping to heal. So I'm very grateful to Americans for the Arts for their continued advocacy in expanding access to arts education and for helping to make sure that the next generation is passionate about the arts. Thank you again, and I look forward to the conversation. Um, I'm always the person who does that so it makes everyone else feel better when they do it. But thank you, Congresswoman, for joining us. Uh, the title of today's program is Because of Arts Ed. So to get the conversation going and as a way of hearing a bit about each of your personal journeys, I wanted to ask each of you to finish that sentence in your own way, Because of Arts Ed, I. And, um, and that will include you, Congresswoman. So I don't know if you want to start us off. 
Well, I'm, I'm happy to, Nora, and thank you so much. Because of arts ed, we have a creative, innovative uh, economy and society. And we can have, because of arts ed, I have a deep appreciation for the power of the arts to help us understand different people, different cultures, to, to communicate, to inspire creativity, preserve cultures, traditions, and really transform communities. And, and I have to say that arts have always been important to me growing up and a part of my life, in large part because of my, my mother who was a piano teacher and player. She took us to museums. She taught me to appreciate music, art, dance. She was a painter and a gallery owner. And I came to Congress. I really got involved, in fact, in education, becoming an, an advocate when I went up to the local elementary school and said, because of budget cuts, where are the arts? classes and where are the, where's the orchestra, where's the band? Um, and so I, I became a, an advocate for, for education, in particular, well-rounded education that includes the arts. And I came to Congress because of my passion for improving um, public education for all students. And you may have heard, uh, I, I serve on two committees, the Education and Labor Committee and the Committee on Science, Space and Technology. And I've consistently sought avenues of support for, for the arts, including in the science committee. Um, and we need to expand that access, especially for underserved students, because we know there's significant equity gaps. I chair the Civil Rights and Human Services Subcommittee in Education. We need to make sure that, that it's not just the students who are in the wealthy areas, but all students have access to the arts. In fact, I'm working on a bill right now to expand arts education in preschool and early childhood childhood programs, in K-12 programs, and especially with a focus on underserved kids, and really to expand the research as well on arts education. And we can use that research in our, our, uh, our educating our colleagues about why this is so import, important. And I've really been grateful year after year, uh, Congress has demonstrated bipartisan support for the arts through continued investments in the National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, they're oftentimes on the chopping block and there is a recognition that that is short-sighted. We need to fund these programs, museums and libraries, especially during this unprecedented time. And I'll continue to fight for the arts uh, because of arts uh, and arts education, all uh, students and all families and all communities benefit um, from not, not only uh, before, but during and after the pandemic. So, so thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, Annette, I'd like to ask you that same question. What arts education has been in your life? Hi, everybody. Oh, it's so great to be here. I'm, I'm just thrilled. <laughs> My heart's pounding. Uh, listen, for me, uh, arts gave me my life. Um, it gave me discipline. It gave me a way to work out my insecurities and to look at myself. Not only the joys and the exhilaration of, of being, being an actress, but also the other side of it, the side that is um, sometimes hard to face within yourself. So that's something that arts education does for everybody, whether or not you become an artist. It's not about that. It's about hearing your own voice inside of you, like we all want to do, and find a way to hear it for ourselves and then maybe communicate it. I had a great public um, education in Southern California where I grew up. My sixth grade teacher taught us Spanish uh, by doing The Three Little Pigs the play, The Three Little Pigs, and I was the narrator, and my first line, I still remember it, aquí están los tres cerditos. Um, my, my eighth grade chorus teacher, what a woman, her name is Mrs. Killian, and I will always be grateful to her. She marched around, she was very strong-minded, she did teach us chorus, but then she also taught, taught us about the great composers, Bach, Beethoven, Handel, and anytime I hear any of that music, I always think of Mrs. Killian, and I could never thank her enough. My high school drama teacher, Anne Archer Krill, who was an actress herself and a very impassioned woman, I was knocked out by her. She had a temper tantrum once backstage during the show because we weren't giving it enough. I was in awe. Uh, that, that gave me a lot. 
community college. I had a fantastic, I was so lucky. I went to Mesa Community College where we had a theater program there. It was a two year program run by these two incredible men, Art Knoll and Milton Woodruff. They became my heroes. I did The Good Woman of Setswan, which is this Bertolt Brecht play. I didn't even know what Bertolt Brecht was, but I learned. Um, and then I went to San Francisco State. So I had a really, got my theater degree there. So my public school education, my art education gave me so much. And I will always be grateful to my teachers and just being able to be here today and say thank you to all the, the teachers out there. Um, I, I saw in the chat, there was a music teacher from Des Moines, Iowa listening. She teaches voice to sixth to eighth graders. My mom and dad are from Iowa, okay? And my mom was a voice major from the University of Iowa. She took me to my first opera. So I just, being able to say thank you and being able to express how much it means to me to be part of this uh, effort, I, I really appreciate, especially during these tough times. 60% of us in the arts are out of work right now. There's a lot of economic hardship, people losing their insurance. So feeling connected to all of you and to everybody out there, this is what we need to be connected. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Annette, so much. Uh, Denise, same question for you, arts education in your life. Well, I'd just like to say that, uh, like everyone here, I am just so grateful to be here and amongst this esteemed uh, panel of wonderful, great uh, thought leaders and, and great artists. So it's a delight to be here. Um, I could just listen to Annette speak all day about her experience. So it's a, uh, my story was not unlike hers in that um, arts and education certainly gave me the life that um, I have today and that I have been able to travel all over the world and sing in the most uh, incredible theaters with the most amazing conductors and in front of royalty. And, and I don't say that to impress you, I say that because it impresses me because I'm this girl who grew up in Washington DC and Southwest on the other side of the tracks as it were. And um, it wasn't until, uh, well, it's a long story, but um, I was this kid who was very awkward and very uneasy with being um, you know, socially very awkward. Um, and I didn't want to go to school and very much attached to my mother. And I cried and cried. And it wasn't until um, they began playing music that I loved then going to school. And I had a fantastic teacher who was my elementary school, actually my kindergarten music teacher, and, um, and she, she saw straight away that uh, I was this little uncomfortable kid who um, wasn't very popular amongst the other kids, but I loved to sing and I loved to go to music class. And so she would um, sometimes give me a solo. And then when I graduated uh, elementary school to go to junior high school, unbeknownst to both of us, she became, um, she was also the music teacher at that junior high school. So. Um, I ran into her one day in the hallway. She told me about All City Chorus. Um, I got involved in All City Chorus. She would come and pick me up Saturday mornings from my apartment um, with my family, would take me to rehearsal, stay with me all day long, and take me back home. When I graduated junior high school to go to high school, um, she, she was the one who told me about this performing arts high school, the Duke Ellington School of the Arts in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown and she said you know you've got a pretty voice you should audition for this performing arts school and so she got the application we filled it out together I auditioned and then she became uh, the vice principal of the school so literally from kindergarten through the time that um, I graduated high school she was my guardian angel and uh, so many people like her who just went above and beyond the call uh, of duty who extended themselves and made such a difference in the lives of so many people, not just mine, but so many other people, so many other colleagues like mine. There's a wonderful singer who's on the scene right now, Ryan Speedo Green, who's a baritone and uh, singing around at the Metropolitan Opera. And he talks about growing up in a very, very difficult situation, um, uh, being away at a detention center. And it wasn't until a singer like, uh, 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 a teacher like the teacher that I had, Judith Grove, 
Alan, who saw something in him, but this, a life that could have certainly taken a very different path um, and introduced him to music and it changed his life completely. So I know of so many people who have, who I share that story with, that music gave us the lives that um, we have. And I, we're all here because we recognize that the arts are essential and art informs almost everything that we do. It's everywhere we look, it's everywhere, you know, uh, everything is art. And that the knowledge plus creativity creates such innovation. And, um, and uh, I have been lucky enough to, and I think we all have to witness that uh, on a daily basis, the power of what um, art can do. So I'm just delighted to be here and to share that little part of, of and my story and to say that I am absolutely committed to continue to, to do whatever work and use my voice in whichever way that I can to, um, you know, to just keep pounding on the doors until we get those doors open <laughs> for good. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Denise. And what an incredible voice. And I love that there are so many teachers getting their shout outs. Uh, Josh, I'm going to turn to you, the, the, the son of an of a, of a LA Unified School District art teacher. So welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm so humbled to be here. Uh, Nora, Bob, thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, wonderful uh, online event. Uh, and it has been uh, a great privilege in my life to, to, as Denise says, pound on those doors for arts and for arts education. Um, what the arts and what arts education specifically has meant to me, it, it allowed me to find my voice both literally and figuratively. Uh, I, I say that, you know, because I was a shy, shy kid. I was somebody that needed the arts in my schooling in order to open up both my vocal ability and also to open up who I was as a human being. I'm seeing a lot of comments that are coming in right now that are so wonderful because what I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of teachers and a huge shout out to those incredible teachers. So nice to see uh, the shout outs, the shout outs to the teachers because my teachers changed that for me. It was, we all need that person. We need that thing. We need that element that helps us understand who we are, what our strengths are, and why the arts is so important, why it was so important in my life as a tool in my education uh, was that it gave me the opportunity to use a language I hadn't used before to express myself. I was trapped inside myself. I was not doing well in school. I had attention deficit disorder. I didn't know what was going wrong. I had a hard time making friends. And it wasn't until uh, a choir teacher plucked me out. And by the way, for, for those young people who are, who are going through what I was going through with those things, you certainly understand what the shyness, the shame of that feels like. And of course, you're going to be the kid in the back row who's just saying, I'm going to get through this day as quietly <laughs> and as cellophane as possible. So to have a teacher pull me out of the back of the choir and say, hey, Curly, I like your voice. You've got something and I want you to learn. Uh, I want you to learn a song. And it was, it was an assignment. It wasn't about whether or not he thought I was going to go on to be a solo singer as a profession. It wasn't about sounding as beautiful as possible. What he knew and what all the great arts educators know is that giving young people those moments to express themselves open up an entire world of possibilities. And I am absolutely devastated right now for all the young people that are not getting those opportunities to do that. It saved my life. Um, it continues to save my life. I I'm very lucky that I got to then continue that moment from the back of the choir into um, into a career where, like Denise, I just I pinch myself at the, at, at the places I've been able to go because of this. But to find talent is is was for me and in so many cases secondary to the fact that um, it gives kids a wider view of themselves and the world. Uh, and at a time when, as uh, as Norris eloquently said, we need that. We need to find, you know, the vaccine for disease and also the vaccine for, you know, the fear and the otherism and the hatred and the tribalism. And, uh, and the arts does that. Arts education in young people does that. And so for me, it, um, it saved my life. I was very lucky that I came, as Nora said, from a family of artists. Uh, my dad is a jazz trumpet player who just, he decided to go into business as a career. But um, my mom, uh, who I think is, is here on the panel tonight, is uh, an arts, it was an arts teacher. And so I was introduced at a very young age to the magic of the arts. But 
I consider myself one of the lucky ones because of that. It's why Americans for the Arts is so important. It's why I'm passionate about arts, arts education as a platform for, for philanthropy. It's why I have my Find Your Light Foundation because uh, as one of the lucky ones, I appreciate the fact that uh, the vast majority of young people in this country are not getting those same opportunities. Our neighborhoods where they don't have that teacher to say, hey, sing this song or write that poem or, or play those drums. Uh, and so when things are tough in this country, oftentimes the arts is the first thing to go. And right now we need uh, more than ever to make sure that we keep pounding on those doors. And uh, as a supporter of Americans for the Arts and all you do and this uh, illustrious and extraordinary panel, I'm so, uh, so honored to be part of, um, I am excited to keep pounding on those doors as well and honored <laughs> to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. And I, and I know you took, you took a brief amount of time away from a busy work day that you have to go back to at some point. So I thank you really <laughs> for, for making that time to be with us. It's it's my privilege. Uh, James, I want to I want to end those questions with you. What what do, what art of education in your life? Well, um, first of all, I do thank you as well for the invitation and for allowing me to be a part of this this group of, of, of speakers and presenters. Um, I think uh, I, I'll say that because of arts ed, I know who I am and I'm deliberately playing with a, a line at the end of a movie by M. Night Shyamalan, um, Unbreakable, um, because of the framing, which I love of this, uh, this conversation, this initial conversation, the idea of origin stories. Um, uh, my father uh, kept a collection of comic books in his closet in his art studio. And um, as we know, superheroes always have origin stories. And so I, uh, the framing is, 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 is perfect for me because for me, uh, from my perspective, the arts are full of origin stories, of identities, of cultures, of nations. We know what civilizations, uh, about the civilizations that passed before us because of the arts and the inventions that they left behind. But more to my story, uh, yes, uh, my father was a professional artist. Um, and so my personal origin story uh, begins at home. Uh, my father was uh, um, post-civil rights era, um, uh, uh, um, veteran, army illustrator, um, someone who, as a black man at a time when many um, men in, in the neighborhood, I grew up in Brooklyn, were simply looking for, for jobs and pensions to try to support their families. My father was either brave enough or stubborn enough, or maybe a combination of, the, of both, uh, to decide that he was going to make his living as a um, professional artist um, and raised a family of six. Uh, so, you know, my father grew up, uh, because of that, there was a, an art studio in the center of my house. So my father uh, was a topography and, uh, a topographer, an art director, a professional graphic designer. Um, and I, I, that, that art studio was also a, a, like a playground for me. You know that uh, oftentimes in superhero mo movies these days, you see that scene where a new superhero is, is attempting to learn how his powers, how his, uh, super, uh, his superpower, superpowers work. And, and that's really what my father's art studio was like for me. Uh, in my case, it was my creative superpowers. I was, it was a place where I began to learn who I was and what I could do and, and to develop that sense of agency in a world that was uh, um, often hostile to, uh, to uh, African-Americans. Uh, I will also say that, um, that for me, the art studio was a it was like a laboratory. Um, it was a it was it wasn't just a studio. It was a place where inventions took place. One of the things that uh, marked my my uh, uh, I think I was in first grade at the time. It was like one of those touchstone moments. One one of my older cousins, who was also an artist, uh, brought me to uh, his classroom at um, Long Island University uh, for as, really as a show and tell exhibit in the sense that there was an argument going on in his classroom about nature versus nurture mm -hmm. and could a child who grew up in uh, a, a, a neighborhood like ours, which was um, uh, really uh, not well uh, underserved, um, could grow up gifted uh, without um, uh, teachers that, uh, that poured uh, into him in, in a way that it was that possible. And I just remember the opportunity to, to share with uh, um, adults, young adults, and, and the interest in the stories that I was telling visually, because I basically brought in a bunch of drawings 
and stories that I was telling through my drawings. And ultimately, that sense of agency, that sense of, of the, uh, that I could make something out of nothing. And that, that even out of the neighborhood that I grew up in, which was, like I said, was, was, uh, uh, was a struggling neighborhood, um, I could make my life, I could make a life for myself in the same way that my father made a life for himself as a creator. Um, ultimately, where that led me was to a high school of art and design, which is the same high school that my father went to when he was a, a child, a, a, a teenager, uh, even though it was called the high school of industrial art at the time. Um, I uh, then went on to uh, the Cooper Union in New York City, um, where it was the first time as an undergrad student, an, an undergrad art student, I was able to teach high schoolers art. And that's where I first got bit by the bug that, wait a minute, it's more important. It's just as important to be a catalyst for other people's creativity as it is to be focused on my own. And to be, to be honest with you, to this day, as I teach teachers how to teach art, I, I think of myself as a creativity teacher. And I, and I try to, to pass that notion along to uh, my students as well. So ultimately, just like uh, Denise and Josh, um, it, uh, the arts saved my life and gave my life a trajectory, gave myself, gave me a pathway um, and helped me to see myself as a force uh, for um, uh, for productivity and for um, making things that matter, giving my best away. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Thank you to all of you. What amazing stories. And again, lots of applause to all the teachers who who made all of you who you are today. And I'll give my shout out to Mrs. Feld and, and uh, Ms. Kinzelberg, who were big influences on my life um, in the public school system in New York. Um, I want to just welcome those who are just joining us and hope that you will sign our arts pledge and or make a donation. Go to americansforthearts.org forward slash because of arts ed or text arts to 833-932. 2382. We're going to dive into specific questions. And Josh, I want really want to start with you. Um, uh, you really took arts education to a whole new level in your life when you made it the focus of your charitable foundation. So can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the Find Your Light Foundation? Sure. And you just reminded me with your shout out that in all my talking about shout outs to teachers, I actually forgot to name check the teacher that pulled me out from the back. So big, big, big thanks to Mr. Barrett and Mr. Cohen and Mr. Sorensen, three of my amazing uh, music and theater teachers. Um, but uh, I have to say, Nora, that um, my, my transition from all around philanthropy to a focus specifically on the arts and arts education came because of your invitation kindly to have me testify uh, on the Hill uh, for, wow. uh, for arts education. It was one of the most rewarding and ch challenging, as you guys know, every single day, uh, uh, things that I've, I've ever had uh, given the opportunity to do. But I realized in that moment that it was my silver bullet. Um, just a quick backtrack on how it all got started, um, because it's just so zany, as so many of the best things are. Um, I was doing a concert at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles, California. It was one of my first concerts ever, one of my first concerts in Los Angeles, certainly. And uh, it was around 2004 and a group of fans came to the front of the stage and they stopped the concert, um, which if you've ever been to one of my concerts, it's just, it's not, that's not the kind of concert I do. <laughs> so, you know, it's not usually like a, interrupting and rowdy. So they came up and they said, we're going to stop the show. And they handed me a jumbo check and they had raised money. Um, they had sold a bunch of things. I don't know what they sold to get this money, some autographs and things like that. And they said, Josh, we want to give you this check if it's for 60 or $70,000. And they said, whenever you start a foundation, we, we're right there with you and we want to be a part of it. And I was so, I was so unbelievably moved by that. I couldn't believe what was happening. And, um, and, I, and I took their pledge and I immediately started what at the time was just an overall Josh Groban Foundation. And, uh, and we started taking money and we matched them dollar for dollar. And, and we started giving a little bit to a lot of different places. And about five or six years later, after a lot of places had gotten some meager donations from us, I realized that my my biggest hit would be in uh, in focusing on where I had a big story to tell. And so I made the pledge at that moment that I was going to continue personally to donate and support lots of different organizations, but that for a foundation, we wanted to really make sure we were picking places where a little bit could go a long way and that that one donation could make sure that a young artist had the opportunity to change their entire lives as it did for me. So the Find Your Light Foundation 
became what it is. Mm -hmm. And since then, we've raised millions of dollars for students around the country. We'd love to go global at some point. And we just want to make sure that those programs in school and out of school um, don't fall through the cracks at the time when they're most in need. Uh, and you see it on the eyes of their faces when they're given that paintbrush and given that opportunity. And it just, it just churns every, every fire of what we do. And um, I couldn't be more proud of it. We're a family-run foundation. My mom, who's here, is, uh, is on the board with me. As, as is my, my dad and my brother. And so um, it's, it's been a passion. It's been an extraordinary thing and we can't wait to keep building it. Fantastic. And, and I've seen its effect and it, it is extraordinary. So congratulations. And we thank, you, we thank you and Americans for the Arts for your support over the years. It's meant everything to us. Yeah, well, it's beautiful to watch, watch it grow. And I remember attending a large arena concert of yours some years back in Minneapolis where you had set aside a, side, a section of this very large arena for local art education, non-for-profits. And in the middle of your show, the music stops and you talked about the value of the arts education and the arts in your own life. And then you had the lights shine on all of these students and administrators from the local arts ed organization. So basically you were introducing these organizations to their hometown communities and encouraging the tens of thousands of people in the arena to recognize and support their work. And it was so moving to see that and so moving to see the reaction of the whole audience who then gave these uh, young people and, and those who led the organizations a huge round of applause. Uh, and I know you also make a point of incorporating local art education organizations and their kids in your concerts. For instance, I think just recently you did, you had a choir perform with you at Radio City. So tell us a little bit about why that's important to you, why that connection of introducing communities to members of their communities, which is such a powerful thing to do. Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, to have the privilege of being able to perform around the world, um, is one that I don't take lightly. And every time I step put foot on a stage, large or small, um, it's imperative for me that I make sure that we highlight in some way in that opportunity, in that pedestal, um, the great arts work and the great arts education work that's being done um, in that city. And to, um, and to kind of ask the audience to heed the call to support the local arts and arts education in their city. Um, there's going to be a lot of songs to be sung, but if I can take those moments where not only I can, A, invite people to the audience, and by the way, I got to have this opportunity on Broadway too, where I was not in charge, but it was incredible mm -hmm. to see that on certain matinee days, the whole first balcony was full of students. Those were my favorite shows mm -hmm. of any of those shows is when we got to hear the hollering and the, and the clapping and do a Q&A afterwards, and they'd be asking us questions about war and peace and all these other things, mm -hmm. and it just, it just lit me up. But beyond inviting them to the seats. Um, it is also, as you mentioned, so important for me to, um, when I can, showcase those students onto my stages. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my favorite moment of the shows as well. When I get to invite choir members, I get to invite a soloist um, from local organizations, from local schools, um, people who are still in high school and college that are still in training. Um, I, at 17, I got pulled out onto the Grammy stage, you know, fresh out of 11th grade, you know, to sing with Celine Dion. And, you know, that's just such a lottery ticket of a moment that is just a, it's like getting hit by lightning. So every time I get to go on a stage, if, if I have an opportunity to give that lightning to, to pass on that lightning to someone else or to a group of other singers or performers, to give them that aha moment where they get to look out and, and feel that part of themselves, uh, it's, it is my absolute favorite part of what I do. And it's something that I'll never stop doing because it's just, it's just so fun and it's, uh, and it, uh, and, it, and it pays back, it pays the world back in dividends. And it's so huge for the community as well. Um, we've Thank had you. a lot of shout outs to teachers and uh, Josh mentioned that his mother, Lindy, is a teacher. Um, there's also in the Facebook chat, there was a shout out, I'm reading this, shout out to the moms that continue to show up when their kids are on stage. And, and that's a perfect cue for, for the next person I'm gonna to ask to join, join the, the conversation. I wanna bring on um, someone who has the perspective of both being a parent of two artist sons, but also that of a former LA Unified School District visual arts teacher. And that's Lindy Groben, Josh's mom, and one of his partners in, in the foundation work. 
<clears throat> so welcome, Lindy. Uh, welcome to the screen and welcome to this event. And thank you for the great job you've done with Josh and Chris. So, um, but I wanted to start by asking you that same question that I asked our other, um, uh, other panelists. What has art education been in your life? Well, um, first of all, I, I want to thank you, Americans for the Arts, for all you have done for us and all the work that you do, and you've helped us with the foundation numerous times. I want to, I'm still in, I'm still in awe and listening to the panelists and so moved by their personal individual stories that I could listen to all of them forever. <laughs> but um, for me, arts education uh, has enriched my life beyond all my imaginings. Um, I, being the oldest member of this group by far, <laughs> I remember the days in um, the LA public school system that I went through as a child, that in elementary school, my first exposure was in playing the three-quarter bass in the uh, junior in the uh, elementary school orchestra, being in two plays as a sixth grader, and um, having the art mobile visit our school. Uh, it was, and then in junior high school, uh, going on and playing the violin in the, in the orchestra. Uh, Mr. Werfel was one of the best uh, music teachers I'd ever had. But um, my first ballet, my first opera, my first concert was through the LA public school system. And to fast forward a bit, I uh, actually went away to school and my mother was kind of at loose ends and wound up working as a secretary in the art department of the LA city schools and worked on curriculum guides. But um, when I first, uh, when I went away to school, I, I, my first major was in uh, sociology. My degree was in sociology, minor in anthropology. I waited till my senior year had a, um, a, a, decided because I was very shy, insecure, decided to take an art class, which I'd always wanted to do, but I was afraid that I would be judged. I was afraid of failure, but I did my senior year. That combined with a trip, a kind of crazy trip to Europe with my college roommate uh, and visiting every museum, opening up another whole world of visual arts to me. I, I came home. Uh, um, uh, I had a job waiting for me at the YWCA. <laughs> and wound up going back to school, getting my degree in arts education and my teaching in art and in my teaching degree and teaching then in LA city schools in East LA in an area being very green, uh, not a strong speaker, <laughs> but um, experiencing uh, firsthand the impact that arts had on the well-being of children. And my classroom was a melting pot of ESL kids who, who that was their first entry was into the arts education program. I had children that were from a home for emotionally uh, troubled youth and also children that were from a, uh, a home for boys uh, that, that, that had been um, uh, uh, placed there by the courts. Uh, I had kids of all colors and I realized that my art classes and they were seventh, eighth and ninth were more, more than about teaching art and they were a refuge. They were a place for children uh, to find themselves. They were a quiet place where they could go inward and they could express themselves and I could have conversations with them while they worked. And, um, and then, uh, and, well, I was going to say that they were not, uh, they were kids that could raise a ruckus if, if they 
and, and me being a green and um, new teacher, uh, I was relieved that they would sit and work and be engaged. And there was a sense of calm. And, um, and then being a parent um, of, I, um, uh, of two talented kids, uh, our younger son, Josh, uh, we know Josh, but our younger son, Chris, is a graduate of USC Film School and is now a director. And um, uh, it, it provided, we had the means to provide our children with um, uh, access to the arts uh, and to take them to shows, uh, take them to concerts, to give them classes of any anything that they wanted or that that they loved at the moment um, and then and then now being able to be part of this foundation has been the greatest gift of my life and to be able to use what I've learned along the way and I'm still learning in the foundation is just capped a lifetime of of being in the arts here it's on her end oh I did I'm sorry it, I can't I did it again sorry okay. I wanted to <laughs> thank you Lindy I also recognize that there is a crew waiting for Josh to get back to, yes. Um, yes. to what he has to do so I'm going to ask you a follow-up question at, in a while so hang yeah, in there with fine. us. Uh, and tough acts to follow, and I'm very nervous. <laughs> no, you, no, you are you are among family and friends, literally. So and and there's so much love in the chat for you. So you, we'll share that oh, with you later. Oh. But Josh, I want to thank you for joining. This is why us. I'm so lucky. I'm listening to her speak, and I'm just going. I mean, this is why I'm the lucky one because I, I got to grow up with this, and I got to grow up with this extraordinary compassion and, uh, and and ability to uh, to uh, expose the arts into our lives and uh, and I'm forever forever grateful for it so um, yeah so thanks for making the time to be with us Josh and congratulations on on being an artist at work during this um, crazy <laughs> yeah. time <laughs> yeah what a strange coincidence that uh, we're all uh, wearing masks and doing what we can but uh, I, I so appreciate you having us on and so appreciate appreciate the amazing work you do, and and endlessly uh, inspired and humbled by your incredible panel and, and everybody who's been writing in and sending messages. Uh, keep fighting the good fight. Uh, sign the pledge. Use your vote. Get out there and change lives because that is really what is happening here, and it pays back for your entire life. And so, um, thank you for that for that and for for your amazing work. And I'm I'm here as your as your champion and soldier whenever you need. We lo I love thank you guys. You. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. So I, it's, hard to, it's hard to switch gears, but I'm going to move over to Annette with some questions for you. And I thank all of you for, for being with us and listening to this. I'm such a moving conversation. Uh, Annette, I want to ask you first question about, about parenthood. You're the mother of four uh, and an artist who is married to an artist. So it may not be surprising to some that all of your children, your four children, have become artists themselves. Uh, oftentimes though, kids will run screaming in the opposite direction of where their parents' interests lie. So I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about arts education in your kids' lives and what role it's played in the growth of the family. Wow, uh, listen, I think that my kids have been very lucky because they've all been uh, passionate about the arts since they were little. It, like you said, it's sort of, like Denise said, it's everywhere. It's in the air that we breathe. And certainly it's in all the conversations that we have in our house. Um, so that seemed their lives and their education drew them in that direction uh, instinctively. My oldest son is a, is a writer and he's a poet. And that has opened up so much to me. I mean, of course, that's what we learn as parents, isn't it? We think we're going to be teaching them, but it, what ends up happening is your children just teach you. So my son, who is a poet, um, has really opened my eyes. And he sends poet, uh, pieces of poetry to our, our family group chat all the time. Not only his own poetry, but other people's poetry. He sent to, he sent to, to Mary Oliver poems the other day. And I, I, I think that uh, for me, these, these moments of being able to consume something beautiful during hard times is, is so essential. 
In fact, this morning I thought when I sat down, I was going to read some prep work for this and some other nonfiction. And then I thought, no, I, I really need a piece of fiction. And I picked up a short story by a woman named Shanteka Siggers. And she wrote a story called Away With B. And it's a story about a teacher and a student, which uh, beautifully written, uh, a, a woman in Chicago who's found a, a girl who clearly needs help. And it's a beautiful story. So, well, we learn as audience, we start as audience members, don't we? Of whatever, uh, we, we learn as consumers of art, in other words, when we're shown a beautiful painting, when our teacher plays a piece of music for us, my, uh, my ninth grade uh, English teacher, Mrs. McLaughlin, took us to a Shakespeare play. Like Lindy, I, I, all of the early kind of performance experiences came through public school. And we went to see a play at the Old Globe Theater in San Diego. And I was blown away because I, I didn't understand everything they were saying, but I knew what they meant because I felt it in my heart and I saw the sweat on their faces and I heard the timber of their voices and of course the great poetry of Shakespeare. And that, I think it opens a door because some art, not all, but some art can have great intellectual rigor combined with feeling, with emotion. That's why I love drama because those things are combined. And all of the great dramatic playwrights um, for centuries are, have been an inspiration to me and it's literature I, I just adore studying. Um, but it, it is, it, it does, as Denise said, it's, art is so pervasive, it's so everywhere in our lives that we are like fish in the ocean that don't know what water is. It is just everywhere. It means everything to me and to my kids and to my entire family. My parents are dedicated Republicans. I'm a Democrat, but when it comes to music and art um, and storytelling, we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I want to ask you a very quick question because in addition to your incredible work as an artist, you're also a powerhouse advocate on behalf of the arts, community colleges, artist rights. Uh, there was a shout out in the, in the feed here uh, to you for helping to get California's SB 916 arts teaching credentials rule passed. So I, I would love you to just, for those who are listening, uh, who want to begin advocating and don't really know how or um, what would you what would you say to people that are that are wanting to advocate how should they do that and what is what is it that you do that is so um, powerful in the advocacy that you do you know i when i was first asked to be on the california arts council we had no money in the in the arts council jerry brown had started it it had been well funded and then when i was involved we had some governors that weren't interested in funding the arts in California. We were way down at the bottom in terms of our funding. We're up now. They've gotten a bunch of money into the California Arts Council. So that's great. But at the time we had zero. So really is all almost zero, just enough to keep us going <laughs> and to pay a few staff. Um, and so we spent all of our time talking about why does art matter? And, and when I first started, I found myself speechless because for me, it was so obvious <laughs> that I didn't even know how to put it into words. So um, now I, of course, I can't stop talking about it. It, it, it is the in, ineffable part of our experience as human beings. It's taking that, that private world that we each have the thing that no matter how close we are to someone, no one really hears the voice in our own head except us. Okay. And how do, we, how do we take that and express it? And that doesn't mean it has to just be in the arts. Uh, as Dr. Rowling said, this is about teaching the creative process. That's what arts education is about. It's also a place Lindy mentioned being nervous speaking today. I am nervous every time I speak. 
I'm nervous every time I work. And I try to remind students of that because sometimes if you're seen as someone who's more accomplished, and I do it to people too, I think, oh, well, they just got it all together and they're not nervous and they don't have insecurities. Every time I work, I'm afraid. And I used to think that was a bad thing. I used to think, oh, there's gotta be a point at which I just get over that. Well, what I've learned is that, no, that's, it's, it's called divine discontent. And we have to, to learn to live with that, that heart pounding feeling. And when we, when we do, we learn that we can do it in spite of fear. Mm. And then when you learn to do something in spite of fear, then that applies to all kinds of parts of life. That we take a deep breath and we do it anyway. <laughs> and I think for students and everybody out there listening, that's such an important thing to remember. I mean, it's what Denise was talking about. It's what Josh was talking about being the person in the back of the class that some teacher st steps up and says, come here, I want to hear from you. I want to see what you're going to draw. By the way, I just wanted to mention in our arts vote effort, which is an effort to get everybody in the country to vote in the next election, we had this beautiful poster done, wait, that one, by Shepard Ferry, of course, a great artist. And what a great example he is to all of us, someone who, who takes his, his artistic talent and then uses it for a cause greater than himself. And that's what we all want to do as, as artists. It's interesting. Art is about expressing what's inside of us, but ultimately an artistic expression points away from us mm -hmm. and to whatever it is that we're trying to need that. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Denise, I wanted to ask you about your experience as a cultural ambassador because you met singers and artists from many countries and at many different phases in their careers. So this too is kind of a, a, an advocacy kind of role, you as an ambassador to other nations. And I wonder if you could talk about that experience of being a champion for the arts and arts education for the United States, but doing it abroad. So this was, thank you so much. So this was extraordinary. And this was just after 9-11 and President W. Bush, uh, George W. Bush and his administration felt that not everybody around the world liked us <laughs> and that we needed to do some repair damage and we needed to, to sort of change their perspective or change the perception of what people in other countries thought about Americans. So they sent us to places where there was primarily a Muslim concentration, but all over the place. And it was extraordinary to, to go to, you know, a little village in Venezuela or some place in Greece or Crete or where you could find people learning an, the same songs that we learned as kids, you know? Um, and to find this incredible common thread and to know that we are more alike than unalike, that we may be speaking different languages, we may be completely different people, but that there's something that connects and binds us all. And that, that for me was extraordinary because sometimes you know, I mean, I can speak Italian and, and French, and, but there were some places that, where I couldn't speak the language and it was difficult to communicate, but we had this universal language of music or we had this just shared experience um, of our humanity that was so, so, so moving and so touching. It was an extraordinary, um, an extraordinary few years, which um, are some of just the greatest times of my life. And, and, and the, the friendships of, which still exists for me today. Beautiful, beautiful. And now we've heard so much powerful um, uh, conversation from people who had arts educations and grew up to be phenomenal artists. I had an arts education and, and I'm, I'm a very passionate arts advocate and, um, and a curator, but I didn't follow 
the passion as you did. And, and I think it's important for us to talk about those who had arts education, but chose other paths. So I'm gonna turn it over to Narek and he'll lead the next phase of conversation. Thank you. And it's been fascinating at this so far to hear the personal stories and the way that the arts connect to all of you. Uh, I wanted to uh, unfortunately shift to a little bit more of the advocacy side and the celebration for National Arts Education Week was originally around arts education advocacy and it continues 10 years, 10 years later with that as a focal point. Uh, I wanted to go back to the Congresswoman if I could. Uh, be, you have both founded and, and continue to lead the Congressional STEAM Caucus. Uh, I wondered if you could share a little bit about that. And I did want to just mention, I also want to come back to uh, the every, uh, the, the final uh, couple minutes of uh, the Every Soon Succeeds Act as a follow-up when you're uh, finished with the STEAM, the STEAM update. Sure, sure. Thanks, Derek. And it's been wonderful listening to these stories. What a difference it makes. And, and before, as I answer that, that question about the STEAM caucus, um, you know, I, as a, as a policymaker, as a, as a mother, as a member of the community, I, I support arts education for, for every student. But sometimes, as Annette was saying, we find ourselves talking with people who don't really understand, why does arts education matter? Why do we need the arts? And sometimes there are conversations with people who might say, well, I, I support the arts, but I don't think that they need to be public fund, they're publicly funded. They should be funded by the private sector. So as we have these conversations with policymakers, I found myself um, both, as, as, as you heard in the, the kind introduction, on the education committee and on the science committee. And there were lots of conversations about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and why those are important. We didn't hear anybody saying, why is arts education important? They were saying, why is, why is STEM important? Well, then I'd get out into the real world and I'd talk with employers and, and businesses. And, and in the community, I kept hearing, here's what we're looking for. We're looking for people who are creative, people who are innovative, people who can come up with new ideas to solve problems. Uh, but nobody was talking about how we educate people to be creative and innovative. So that's when I started the STEAM Caucus. Um, and I have to say that it has been a very positive step to, to raise awareness of uh, the, the value of the arts and arts education integrated into science, technology, engineering, and math. It doesn't mean that, that we don't support arts education for all outside of, of, of STEM. But I want to say what a difference it has made in, 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 for example, the two nationally recognized STEAM schools in Northwest Oregon. I've seen really firsthand the power um, of, of STEAM. And the, the first time I went out to visit Quintana Elementary in Hillsboro, Oregon, I was visiting a third grade class and they were talking about worms and growing worms in soil and how the soil is dirt and the dirt becomes clay. And then they took the clay and they glazed and fired it. So instead of saying, now we're studying science and now we're studying art, there was a connection and they were connected and the students were engaged. And, and I have to say that Nobel Prize winning scientists are much more likely than other scientists to be engaged in the arts. In fact, the text of the National Arts an education congress congressional resolution has a quote from Albert Einstein saying, the greatest scientists are artists as well. I think about Leonardo da Vinci, of course, as well. So the, the integration of arts and design into STEM can also help bridge the gender gap and also address some of the equity issues. Um, girls um, oftentimes say, I'm good at, at art, but I, I'm not good at science or math. So it helps bridge that and diversity in our science and tech workforce, which has historically not been inclusive of women and people of color, makes a difference when underrepresented populations are around the table identifying problems and helping to solve them, we get better solutions. And another example from a sixth grade class at, uh, at Quitama Elementary, uh, we were visiting a group of us, uh, took the, the then chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, Jane Chu, out to, to visit Quitama. We talked to two girls in sixth grade who were narrating the stop motion animation film that they made to explain cell division. 
Now, when I was in sixth grade, I don't think I could have stood up in front of grownups and explained how I made the film to, to, to help people understand cell division, but it was pretty incredible to see, not only did they understand the concepts, but they could explain them in a creative way. So there's a lot of benefits to STEAM education. Uh, for many students earlier this year, I introduced the Bipartisan Building STEAM Education Act. Uh, to, to help uh, get uh, federal, more federal investment and in expanding resources and grant opportunities to support STEAM education. And, and uh, Narek knows, and Bob was at the, the, the bill signing for the, the Every Student Succeeds Act, which I helped to write, served on the conference committee. And a big focus of that is well-rounded education that includes the arts. And, and that was the thing that I wanted to just share quickly. We, we captured your work uh, back in 2015. I remember uh, those days. <laughs> and we called it the four minutes that changed STEM to STEAM. Uh, we have the video and we have a little breakdown here on our blog, which we'll share. But it was really a fascinating moment where inside of four minutes and, you know, people, we, we lobby and advocate on arts education and you do throughout the year, four years. And in this case, it came down to literally four minutes in your final work on that, on that conference committee that included, that made STEAM become uh, increased, uh, an increased federal support. Uh, and so thank you for doing that. Those are four minutes well spent. Well, thank you, Narek. And, and again, the focus uh, in, in the Every Student Succeeds Act is well-rounded education, moving away from teaching to the test and allowing students that opportunity to express their individuality and creativity through that well-rounded education, but also uh, STEM to STEAM, and it really has made a difference. Thanks, Narek. Absolutely. Now, uh, if I could just ask you one last question uh, in terms of the federal work, uh, we are anticipating some great challenges for education overall as the impact from the coronavirus takes hold at the school district level and the state department of education level. Uh, do you think, uh, what kind of advocacy you think is needed to try and support, uh, to, to, for advocates to speak in support of arts education at any level, at federal, state, and local levels, be, based on that economic uh, uh, challenge and threat that's coming down. Well, I appreciate that. And, and the, I think the message doesn't change. It just becomes more important than ever. And I think about what's helping get people get through these really challenging times. They're, they're reading, they're, they're, they're watching movies, they're listening to music, uh, they're some playing games, all things that were developed by creative people. Uh, and telling those stories about, and, and we heard them today from the panel about why arts education makes a difference to students. I have seen introverted, quiet students get onto a stage and absolutely shine. My daughter went to an arts, public arts magnet school, and she's been everything from a software engineer to an investigator, data reporter, and she's not afraid to get up and interview someone or tell a story or communicate what she's learning because she did a lot of theater growing up and had that background. I've seen uh, from my work as a parent volunteer helping with uh, after school theater, volunteer run theater programs, the students just thrive and want to participate, want to come to school because they're gonna be in the play or they're gonna be in the choir. So I think it, it certainly during these times when we're gonna be hearing about the need for budget cuts, it is now more than ever, and, and we had the turnaround schools for the arts where we saw we're bringing in arts education, helps students stay engaged, helps them find their voice, as we heard from, from so many today. So it is, it is a, the same message, arts education is important. It's important to well-rounded education. It's important to our students uh, and engaging them. It's important to our economy. And if we need to educate people today for the jobs of tomorrow, we don't know necessarily what those jobs are. They need to be creative, critical thinkers. We're not gonna get creative, critical thinkers if we cut the arts. Thank you. And, and for those that are interested in doing that kind of advocacy the Congresswoman has just uh, suggested and certainly all of our guests have been talking about, we have an action kit for those uh, that are looking for some guidance in how to go speak to your, your principal, your school district, and other decision makers, and that includes videos and other helpful resources uh, in the for the advocacy that lies ahead. 
I'd like to shift if I can. Speaking, we were we were speaking about STEAM, and uh, in, in part that is connected to art and design, and design is a is a visual art. Uh, James, I'd like to bring you back in. Uh, you are president elect of the National Art Education Association, uh, and I wondered if you could share a little bit about what you're seeing, and you're an educator. I wondered if you could share a little bit about what you're seeing and observing from your association position and as an educator as well. Sure, there's uh, so many ways uh, uh, for me to connect. I wanted to chime in first uh, just uh, on uh, uh, reflecting a little bit on what Rep Representative Bonamici mentioned about STEAM. STEAM is actually quite old. Uh, you know, we, you, you go back to the old Renaissance workshops uh, where folks were learning uh, arts and metallurgy and chemistry and uh, it's 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 something that uh, you, you know that I connect to because I went to a high school of art and design because I went to a Cooper Union for the advancements of science and art. It's something that um, I'm very happy to see happening in my community in Syracuse, where we've just approved uh, a uh, a new STEAM high school. Uh, Seventy five million dollars has been appropriated for it, or, or or is being raised for it. It's been a, through the approval process. This kind of work is urgent. Um, because of, uh, of we live in traumatizing times, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the, I, I asked a question to some folks and uh, colleagues of mine um, in terms of how folks are dealing with the trauma of, of, a, of a once in a hundred year pandemic, um, the trauma of seeing um, uh, violence um, perpetrated uh, and uh, without justice, on folks because of uh, the color of their skin. How, ultimately, I think that the arts allow for that kind of the kind of agency that says, no, wait a minute, we matter, I matter, our lives matter, uh, and, and, and gives an avenue for processing that and sharing that and sharing the best, developing that. It's not magic. You, there's a process that's involved in it. So within schools, um, you know, uh, talking about uh, the uh, uh, um, what folks are dealing with now with the pandemic, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag is what I'm hearing, is what's being shared with me. Um, folks are learning uh, new ways to teach, um, wherein um, uh, their, their, their efforts to do demonstrations are now recorded, right? Um, it, folks are, are, are uh, uh, there's one teacher who told me a story about how the the new parameters of of uh, teaching remotely and at a distance uh, has opened up space and time for students who are, are whether they be the, their her advanced learners or her neurodiverse learners, giving them more time to work on projects than typically was able to happen in a classroom. More space, a different kind of space. It's been productive in ways that she didn't expect. Others are dealing with the difficulties of trying to roam through hallways, uh, teaching art on a cart, and trying to keep things um, clean and safe uh, for themselves and for their students. Um, it's a very stressful time, uh, but yet uh, I've noticed that, and I've and I've been hearing that folks are learning how uh, the, what the new normal might will eventually look like once we come out of this, because it won't be the same normal. Uh, uh, how we're going to learn to teach in a different way and, and learn the lessons. Uh, that uh, that these uh, difficult and traumatizing times have have uh, sort of forced us to have to learn. Yeah, and 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 that brings up. Uh, I'll come back to just that point, James, because I think it's really important as you think about teaching the next generation of teachers as well. Uh, because of the uniqueness of this year, National Arts and Education Week wanted to honor, in addition to educators and administrators and policymakers, and of course, our nation's uh, students, uh, the unexpected role that families are also playing and guardians are playing in assuming. Uh, so much of the responsibility of making sure that their children are studying from home and getting the full rounded education that they need. So to that end, we wanted to frame part of this conversation from a multi-generational perspective and include uh, students and children as well as parents. So you met Lindy's mom, and but now to that end, We've just welcomed in Ella Thomas Montgomery to the conversation. Hi, Ella. Uh, and Ella is an 11th grade theater major at Walnut Hills School for the Arts in Massachusetts, 
but she's now currently working remotely from home in Maryland with her family, including her mom, Denise. So um, welcome, Ella, and we're really happy that you are joining us. Um, knowing that we have both parents and students watching us today, I wanted to get your perspective on this unusual school experience that you've had these past six months. How have you been doing? And have you seen any upsides to remote learning beyond enjoying your mom's great cooking, which um, you get to do now on a regular basis? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I'm so happy I could be here and give my two cents on the situation. Um, it's definitely been really hard being at home, especially when I'm at a point in my schooling where I feel like we're almost there. We're almost looking at college and everything like that. And it was just such a disruptive time to, be, to kind of take a step back and everything. But um, at the same time, I have really enjoyed being online and seeing the creativity of, of other students and of teachers of how we're going to learn. I mean, it's certainly hard, like doing dance class from home or doing acting from home and trying to do scenes. And it's very, I guess, frustrating because you can't get that connection of when you're in the studio with someone. But at the same time, it's been just so great to see um, everyone's strengths and everyone's um, just joy for what they do because if they didn't love it, we wouldn't be doing this. We wouldn't be trying to do it over Zoom. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it's been a great experience and at the same time, it's so frustrating. Me and my friends always say like, why couldn't this have happened when we were like 10 and like we didn't care if we went mm. to school or not. But um, I don't know. I mean, I've, I think a big um, just disappointment was not going back right at the beginning of this school year but at the same time, um, kind of paving the road for what things are going to look like in the future. A lot of people have been saying things like, oh, well, we're never going to need to have snow days ever again because we're going to learn how to do it online or oh. like that, which is, I mean, I guess do what, do what you want with that information. <laughs> but, um, at the same time, it's just, it's been really nice, especially because since I'm at boarding school, I don't see my family all that often anymore. So it's been great to be at home with my parents and my brother and everything like that. That's great. And you brought up that, that snow day thing is, is that's going to be quite an issue. I think when we get back to the, to whatever the new normal is, um, be, and in all that you're studying, whether it's an arts class or a non arts class, what has for you translated the best in terms of this virtual connection? And what do you still think, um, you really need that, that literal hands-on experience for? Well, academic classes, I've actually enjoyed being online to a certain extent because um, the way that my school's doing it, at least, is that we meet um, in class once or twice a week, um, synchronous, and then we do asynchronous learning by ourselves. We're like, these are the assignments, get them done by this time, which I've really enjoyed to kind of just map out my days and get what I need to get done at my own speed. And it doesn't feel like so much is happening at once because I do have like a few days in between to get things done. So academic work, I've actually quite enjoyed um, only because, I don't know, it feels like it's much more up to you when things happen and, and how you decide you need to learn something. And arts classes, I mean, I'd much rather be in person. Um, but yeah, it, that's been hard, mostly because it's just like the, the logistic capabilities of being at home is also so much less because like um, at the beginning of last, at the end of last year, we were doing um, tap in my dance class. And I was like, well, I don't want to scratch up the floor with my tap shoes and everything. So it was hard just kind of logistically getting that kind of stuff done, um, which has been harder than the academics where I found that it just gives me more flexibility with what I want to do. Great. Well, we're so appreciative that you're here with homework and all the other responsibilities that you have. Um, I think we should probably bring everyone back on screen for some Q&A. There's some interesting questions um, from the both the Facebook side of things as well as um, as the, own, the, the chat that we can all see. Uh, but I wanted to go back for a moment, uh, James, just to that question about how you are rethinking uh, the future of uh, teaching in the view that we may wind up in a situation like this where remote learning takes over. Uh, so you're asking... Uh, are you are you going to start teaching what it's like to, to teach at a time of, of catastrophe? Is that going to be part of the new normal of teaching arts education to future arts leaders? Well, I, well, it's already happening. Uh, so, you know, folks are... Uh, this. These are... Uh, devastating times uh, for uh, 
for folks in the arts, uh, for um, uh, uh, folks uh, running small businesses, uh, and once again, and traumatizing times as well. So ultimately, I have uh, seen uh, colleagues shifting, uh, changing their approaches, recognizing that the things that they're learning now in terms of how to teach remotely, teaching asynchronously, synchronously uh, on, on these other platforms are skills that they're going to have to retain um, because there's no, there's no, it's not a lot of certainty about what's going to happen next given that we're in a, in a pandemic. Uh, so uh, so th there's already been shifting and folks have been struggling to, to try to figure out on many different levels, you know, because once again, the National Art Education Association, it has uh, uh, folks teaching K through 12, but also in higher ed, teaching artists, museum educators. Uh, the, the effort to, to, to reconceptualize is not just happening in the business world, but also in the educational uh, fields. And so ultimately, uh, looking at the changes in the national standards, the, the inclusion of, for instance, media arts as one of the standards, uh, uh, art standards along with dance and theater and, and, and music and visual arts, opens up to me opportunities. Uh, uh, because uh, as it's already been alluded to, media arts um, is a ready uh, uh, ally or, 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 or uh, of, of, of steam. It's, it's sort of embedded in it. Right. Uh, and the, the, those notions of those various kinds of literacies. Uh, so yes, folks are, are making that shift and it's a necessary thing in order to survive right now and just to sort of think how we get through it in the, uh, to the next, uh, next normal. Great. Um, we have a question uh, for the Congresswoman. How can we best communicate about the value of arts education to those who have little or no personal experience in the arts and therefore don't share our inherent value in understanding it? That's a great question. Well, well, first I know that Americans for the Arts has a lot of good information about the economic value of, of the arts and communities. Um, storytelling. Storytelling really helps. Um, talking about you know, the examples you heard today about how an art teacher changed a child's life uh, and talking about how people can have that, you know, that sort of personal growth that we heard finding themselves and what that means for, uh, for humanity and what that means for the economy and, and because it's arts education, what that means for education. So I'd say pick a story and tell a story about why it's made a difference to have arts education. We have a lot of great examples from the, the turnaround schools for the arts. Um, one of the STEAM schools, uh, that I visited and did an all school project. Every student was involved in designing and making uh, murals of the mosaics of the seven wonders of Oregon. They involved every student in the project. So it was very inclusive. It was a wonderful project. And so that you're, you're engaging students and students do better. There's research that shows uh, students who have arts education do better in school. So look at the look at the facts, look at the data, but importantly, tell stories. Uh, when when we're talking about policy in the abstract, it's not the same as saying this is how it affects the lives of students, the, and and this is how it affects the school environment. Right. To have arts, you can you can feel the difference in a school that makes arts a, arts education a priority. Yeah, and I want to make sure we put in the chat um, a link to Chris Groban's film uh, that does exactly that, tells the stories. And, and as Lindy has said to me, if you question arts education, you just need to listen to the stories and you'll understand the value. So we'll put the, that link, I think it's gone on just now, the, the Learn More on the Find Your Light YouTube channel. Check out these films that are so exquisite that do a deep dive into the impact of these arts organizations. And I just um, also, we sure. have to focus on the equity piece as well. Um, and, and that's why we need public funding because our, our, our education yeah. should not oh. be for the students who live in, in, oh. in school districts that have made it a priority because they can afford it. We absolutely need the investment for the, for the equity piece. Absolutely. So we are coming up close to the end of our, um, of our time. Uh, and so if you guys will just bear with us for a minute, uh, Bob, I'm not sure if there's anything that you wanted to add, any question you wanted to pose, and then I'll bring us home. Yeah, there is, there is one thing um, uh, that actually is, is a result of looking at a number of the questions. Um, different people, Alice Parker, for example, talked about um, 
uh, quality of life, uh, the fundamental values, quality of life. And uh, I saw Emily Prince talked about intrinsic value. And we've heard about STEAM and economic impact, community development, equity. We are actually simultaneously this week doing a, um, an event on arts healing in the military. And what strikes me is that um, one tool that we have on our website that, uh, and thank you to the Congresswoman for sending people there, we have a thing called the Arts and Social Impact Explorer. It's a pinwheel that has uh, a sliver for about 36 different uh, areas of interest in the community, like all the ones that have already been mentioned. And it allows somebody to go in who wants to talk about quality of life or intrinsic value or the military or equity and click on one of those slivers and see arguments, see facts, see data, see stories. Uh, that is a very, very important tool. And, and one of the things that I've learned over my life of advocacy is that any decision-making body, ah, and there it is, the Arts and Social Impact Explorer, any decision-making body is actually a pie chart, just like that. Uh, the, not every member of Congress is interested in the same thing. Some are interested in health, some are interested in homelessness, some are interested in the military. And so um, the uh, necessity uh, of, of uh, advocacy is to know what your person who you're advocating to is interested in and then shape your arts approach uh, related to that. And this is one tool to be able to do that. And, um, you know, someone else asked for advice about what could you do to get young students involved. And I would say two things. One, um, anybody can join our uh, Arts Action Fund for free. And uh, that makes uh, advocating for issues really, really simple. And secondly, uh, any person should simply start off by saying one thing to one person who is a decision maker about something you care about. And that one moment doesn't take very long, will have an impact, I guarantee you. If you if anybody sent something that they cared about to Congresswoman Bonamici, she would listen and you would hear back from her. So uh, that's, my, that's my advice. Great, and, and James, you had something you wanted to say about storytelling and equity. Well, sure, just, just real quickly. I, I, I wanted to chime in about um, this, the notion of, of access uh, and its importance. So and I'm gonna share something real quickly to, to, uh, uh, to, to make the point. So uh, I learned when I was doing my, my uh, undergrad work um, uh, as a visual artist, I also minored in creative writing. And so I've been a writer, a writer ever since then, writing uh, poetry uh, ever since then. Ultimately, the stories that we, uh, uh, well, let me just say it this way. Um, I'm currently working as, uh, and, and, that, and the story that I just shared there is a memoir that's about to come out in November telling the story of the creativity and why it's important to uh, members at, of diverse communities, um, uh, folks who were in the back of the room daydreaming and chastised for it, and then ultimately um, found their, their pathway into creative uh, 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 careers. And so right now I'm the chair of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Commission for the National Art Education Association. And I just wanna emphasize the notion of access. Um, there are students uh, who are who have stories to tell. As I said before, I talked about the notion of giving one's best away. Um, the life stories of, of students, uh, their, uh, what they have to contribute to our society, giving access and opening, an act, opening up access to uh, students from more diverse backgrounds to find their way into the arts practices, into the creative professions, like my father, like myself, like my younger brother after me, uh, uh, in terms of the intergenerational notion, uh, it's so crucial right now. Uh, and uh, and uh, if we can continue to advocate for that as well as everything else that we've been talking about, um, w that's what's going to end, end up changing the field of the arts uh, and education and the arts in general for generations to come. So I just wanted to hit on that point. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I think sadly, we're a little bit over time. I, I could go on and on just listening to all of these beautiful testimonials from the heart. Um, I wanna thank Annette, Denise, Josh, 
uh, Representative Bonamici, James, Ella, and Lindy, and thank you to everyone who's attended and participated in today's Arts Ed event. Whether through Zoom, through our portal, or Facebook Live, we appreciate so much that you chose to spend this time with us. A reminder that this event was recorded, and uh, you'll be able to see it on our website in the next couple of days, or instantly, if you can't get, if you haven't had enough, you can just watch a replay on Facebook Live. Uh, please remember once again to show your support for arts education during this important and historic week um, by signing the Arts Ed Pledge by going online to americansforthearts.org forward slash because of arts ed or texting arts to 833-932-2382. We'd love to hear your thoughts on what arts education has meant to you and to those in your lives. And again, if you've enjoyed this program and wish to donate to help the work that we do, please do that at the same, uh, through the same link. I want to thank my colleagues, Bob Lynch and Eric Rome for guiding us along uh, this evening, as well as our colleagues behind the scenes, Kelly Faye Bolander, Regina Berger, Moshe Day Edwards, Joshua Jenkins, Heather Pollack, Christina Ritchie, uh, John Rubzaman, and Anne-Marie Watson. It literally takes a village. So thank you also to Sky Robles for her closed captioning skills. And once again, our hearts are with all of you in your neck of the woods, Congresswoman, and everyone in the smoke-filled West and the storm-swept South. This really has been quite the year. Uh, we hope everyone everywhere is healthy and safe. Keep those masks on, keep advocating, and keep being loud. And, um, and thank you all for what you do, all you teachers, all you students. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and uh, good night. <laughs>